Um, please, Dave, to please sing up, sing loudly. Um, we're a little uncertain as to how the audio will come across on Zoom. Um, and so it's really important that um, we, we give it our all, which I'm sure everybody will. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to be back in and, and singing again. So uh, I, I'm sure in a true Methodist way, we'll, we'll belt them out. Um, the collection today, what, we won't be um, circulating and collecting. There'll be a collection plate in the back of the church or the, on your way out. Um, and then I think that's it. All I need to do is uh, uh, welcome Janet Bay and to thank her for leading us in worship this morning. Hello, everybody. Hello to those here in person, to those here on Zoom, and those who might be listening to a recording at some point, anytime. It's good to be with you in person, actually. Um, I'm a Luddite, so I'm not great with all this technology, but um, we're all guinea pigs this morning. I haven't done a hybrid before. Joan hasn't played the organ for a long time, and Din is looking after the technology, I think, for the first time with all of this. So we pray for your patience and your forgiveness in advance of anything that might go a bit awry. <laughs> Our call to worship is from Paul's letter to encourage the early Christians in Corinth. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So there we have Paul comparing the Christian life to running a race. Now I'm no runner. I've never enjoyed sport, and I always did my best to get out of it, even when I was at school. So um, I'm not the best example of a, a sporting mentality, shall we say. But what does inspire me is Paul's way that he compares um, the dedication and the discipline to anyone who is into sports with the Christian journey. Because Paul compares the Christian life to running a race. And that would be a very familiar picture to the Christian, to the Greek population. Because they founded the Olympics, didn't they? Way back in 770 BC, I think. So their culture placed a very high value on physical fitness. Athletes give their all, says Paul, but only one gets the gold. Many are disappointed and dreams are shattered. Well, as we know, the sporting season has been well and truly upon us. And we've had Wimbledon and the football and the Tour de France and the golf. And we'll be seeing lots of awards and trophies and medals handed out over the next few weeks, no doubt in Tokyo the Olympics, a celebration of excellence in sporting achievements. And competitors who've strived and strived and given their all to get there this year will have a somewhat subdued experience, similar to our subdued experience of returning to worship in person. They won't have the supporting spectators there to urge them on, to motivate them, to encourage them. But there's one race we can all be part of and all be winners, says Paul. God's Olympics. Thank God he doesn't favour the physically fit, the strong, the fast any more than the out of shape and the weak and the slow. God loves us all equally and wants the best for all of us. So we come now to worship, to express, to show our pride in the God of the universe, not just our nation, but the God of the universe, 
the one whom we can trust above all friends, above all powers, and the one who helps us rise above all the difficulties that we are experiencing if we take him at his word. So our first hymn, and it's wonderful that we are allowed to sing now. Our first hymn is reminding us of the supreme power of our sovereign God. So let's sing, crown him with many crowns. to go forward, empowering our swift feet to spread your good news. Thank you for keeping us travelling on the path that follows the ways of Jesus, for helping us to shed useless loads, for sharing our burdens in the heat of the day. And we thank you that when our pace slows, you promise strength to the weary. You bless us with time to rest in your presence. Lord, we seek to run the race as your disciples in the power of the Spirit. We seek to run your race 
full of praise and thanksgiving to our Saviour. We seek to run your race, carrying faith, hope and love, confessing Christ Jesus as Lord. We seek to run your race, negotiating the obstacles, blocking our way. We seek to run your race, confident that Jesus runs with us and will pick us up when we stumble and fall. And so as we make our confession, when I say, Lord, we are sorry, would you respond, forgive us and renew us? Gracious God, for allowing sinful thoughts and actions to trip us up, Lord, we are sorry. Forgive us and renew us. For allowing setbacks and disappointments to defeat us, Lord, we are sorry. Forgive us and renew us. For lacking the discipline and the motivation to respond to your prompting, Lord, we are sorry. Forgive us and renew us. For allowing our selfish desires to cloud your vision for us and considering your call on our lives, sometimes to be a step too far. Lord, we are sorry. Forgive us and renew us. Lord Jesus Christ, who endured the cross and gave your all, so that we could complete the race. May our footsteps be planted in yours, for it is to you that we travel. Keep us from being sidetracked or losing heart. Strengthen our resolve to endure and enjoy the challenge of the course you set before us. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So we sing again. Such so lovely to hear everyone singing that first hymn. Even though there aren't many of you, it sounded like a choral society. It was wonderful. So let's uh, let's enjoy another scene. King of Kings, Majesty.
I remember learning a song a long, long time ago at a, a holiday club back in Pinchum, and we used it as a kind of anthem. And that's a bit like an anthem, isn't it? That particular chorus. But this one went, we carry a torch for Jesus. His anthem, his anthem we will sing. For with him we are winners, whatever life may bring. Believe and trust him always and give your life to him. You know you're going for gold if you're going for God. The Olympic rings are a symbol that's inspiring in itself. The Olympic rings represent the five continents and they actually combine all the colours of all the nations, including the white background, symbolising the union of nations, the union of humanity. And that's a particularly powerful symbol, I think, during these times of uncertainty and division. And one of the prayers for this particular Olympics, whether you feel that it should have been held or not this year, a particular prayer is that it will bring some unity back to our nations when there's been so much conflict and inequality of the rollout of the vaccine and so many other issues and problems around the world. We pray that the Olympics will restore some of that feeling that we are all one. But now that holiday club a long time ago, we also gave new meanings to those Olympic rings. With the red, that helped us remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross, the blood that he shed for us. The yellow we used to remind us that we are the light of Christ. The green we used to remind us to go, to go for God, to respond to his call. And the black to remind us that even in times of darkness, we must continue to be faithful. And the blue, to think about the sky and the eagle that God talks about in Isaiah, to be carried on God's thermals like the eagle in the sky. And the white to remind us of eternity, that we are united in Christ for eternity, whatever happens to us in this world. And the Olympics also reminds us of the essentials of discipleship. If we were competing, God forbid in my case, if we were ever competing in the Olympics, what would we need? What would we need to help us to keep going? What would we need? The right kit, reliable equipment. For us, that's first and foremost the Bible. A good coach to motivate us. Even in times of isolation, our good coach has been Jesus. When we've not had any other, some people have not had any other physical person to urge them on or to help them and encourage them and support them other than via technology or the phone. Jesus, a good coach. And daily exercise. Oh. Daily exercise, working out. The spirit, neither the spirit nor the flesh is willing in my case. But <laughs> for some of us, maybe the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. For some of us, maybe we're fantastic. We're really good at getting out there at five o'clock in the morning for a daily jog. <laughs> there are more shaking of heads than nodding here. Not sure about the Zoom people, but... Uh, I know some people amongst Council Carey are pretty keen at their daily exercises, but uh, <laughs> present company accepted, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> if 
for our daily workout. It's probably our daily devotionals for our spiritual workouts. Daily time to spend with Jesus. Maybe house groups as well. Prayer meetings. Pastor Care is usually pretty good at those. And maybe you've managed to continue doing those over Zoom. And we pray that you're able to get back to doing those physically sooner rather than later. 24-7 commitment. Self-control. Discipline in lifestyle. All the things these athletes and sports people have to do without eating to make sure their bodies are absolutely honed for what they need to achieve. Perseverance. The ability to combat weaknesses and to recognize our weaknesses. We all have them, but to know ourselves and to recognize those and then be able to combat them and to be able to move on from mistakes and failures. I strongly suspect that in the Olympics, there'll be more people disappointed than there will that will be glorying in their achievements. And we've already heard about some of those who've strived for so long, but are already not able to continue. We're allowed to fail. We're allowed to make mistakes in the Christian life. And it holds many disappointments for us. But the ability to move on from those is something that we can seek help with and strength with. And the rest and relaxation, those parts of life are important too, so that we don't work, overwork and burn ourselves out. And I think our next hymn kind of reminds us of some of those important aspects on our Christian journey. May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day. Get into the boat 
and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walk on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Thanks be to God. So I don't think walking on water is an Olympic event. I don't think it ever was, actually, and I dare to say never will be. Although I have heard that they've introduced surfing for the first time, which is probably the next best thing. Walking on water, do you think? Have we got any surfers here? No? Perhaps they're all on holiday. Perhaps that's where they've gone. <laughs> So in human terms, walking on water is frankly impossible. But here is Jesus demonstrating God's power over the natural world, shown through himself, the Son of God. Jesus, who healed the sick, calmed storms, provided ready meals to thousands of people. Now he can even walk on water. And the backstory to this is that Jesus has been healing and teaching all day long, miraculously providing that food for that crowd of thousands. So by evening, he would be tired out, drained physically and spiritually. And he's also grieving. He's grieving because he's heard that his cousin John has been beheaded. What would you do after a day like that? I'd be collapsing into bed, exhausted, as I did most days this week, in all that heat, it's just horrendous. Came to the edge of my endurance, I think, this week. Jesus sends his disciples off across the lake in their only boat, so that he can take some time out for himself and he goes up into the hills to pray. And then in the early hours of the morning, Jesus comes to join them. They've already taken the boat, their only boat. But to Jesus, no boat, no problem. He walks across the lake to them on the water. And as you can imagine, that scares the pants off them. They think he's a ghost to start with. So Jesus says, don't worry, it's me. And impulsive as ever, Peter immediately wants to walk on water too. Let me try it, Peter says. Notice Jesus didn't tell him to. It was Peter's initiative. He wanted to. His adventurous spirit prompts him. <coughs> Now, I think there are two types of people in this world. I think there are the have-a-goes and the holdbacks. I wonder which you consider yourself to be. Might be different in different situations. But when it comes to water, I'm definitely one of the holdbacks. I don't even like putting my head under water. I think I'd be sitting in the boat with my life jacket on, 
and my rubber ring at the ready, just in case Jesus says, come on, it's your turn next. That would be me, definitely. Anybody with me in the boat? Or anybody dying to have a go at walking the water themselves? <laughs> hmm. People often quote Rick Warren when they talk about this passage. He said, if you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. That's an inspirational, motivational phrase that's often used. And it's based entirely on the assumption that we all want to walk on water. Do we? Strongly suspect a lot of us would rather actually stay in the boat. Let somebody else have a go, maybe. We can spectate. Maybe it's a similar question to asking ourselves where we are on the taking risks spectrum. I don't like water much, although I can swim if I have to. But I have no problem with heights, and I have friends who really don't like heights. And they won't come with me if I want to walk to the edge of a cliff or anything and have a look at the view. No, they stay well back. But even so, if I saw Jesus jumping over rooftops, I wouldn't be bursting with eagerness to try it and follow him. Definitely not. I'd still be in the hold back and see what happens category. Jesus doesn't refuse Peter. Jesus wants Peter to succeed. He doesn't say, no, Peter, only I can do this stuff. You stay put. Jesus just says one word of brief encouragement. Come. Come. With no risk assessment, no instruction kit, no health and safety manual. None of that comes into it. And Peter doesn't stop to think. His reaction is a response of faith, and that's good. And he wants to imitate Jesus, and that's really good. And he did walk on water for a while, and that's amazing. But then he momentarily gets distracted by the wind whipping up the waves around him. And he takes his eyes off Jesus and then he panics. And when he feels himself sinking, he utters the simple prayer that we all pray in times of crisis. Three words, Lord, save me. Oh, Lord, help me. How many of us have uttered those three words in a time of crisis? As a prayer when we can't think of any other words to say. We can't even think straight. But they won't stop us drowning under the weight of our troubles. We need Jesus. We all need Jesus. The world needs Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only beloved son. So why does Jesus express some dismay at Peter's little faith? Maybe because he doubted Jesus' power to save him. I don't think Jesus says this in a scolding manner. I think he says it with some sadness, some dismay. Because Jesus longs for Peter, for all of us, to lift our eyes above our circumstances and continue to trust him, whatever happens to us in this earthly life. The disciples had witnessed his miraculous powers earlier that day and on many other occasions. And yet there's still a percentage of lack of trust as there is with all of us, because at the end of the day, we're all 
human beings. But would Jesus have encouraged Peter and the other disciples to follow him and then to go ahead of him with the boat? And then let him drown? I think not. And even if he did, he's saved to eternity. Even if we do die in the course of our ministries, we're promised eternity. And when we're faced with a challenge or an opportunity or a calling and Jesus says, come. Do we want to trust that God will empower us and be with us? Or would we rather settle for less? And that's our choice, as it was Peter's choice. We are never forced. We are encouraged, never forced. And Jesus would rather we make a few mistakes on the way than never attempt anything from fear of failing or losing. And he always promises to be with us and rescue us for eternity. And sometimes we can only discern God's guidance by dipping our toes in the water to see what happens. But what of those who say dependence on Jesus is a crutch, a weakness? I think God is saying to them, so you think you can manage without me? You think you don't need your creator, your saviour? You think you don't need to listen to my advice? You don't need me as a companion on your life's journey? Well, let's just wait and see how that works out then. And I think God says this with a heavy heart because he loves those who have yet to trust him just as much as he loves those who already do. Let's pray. Christ, be the power in my purpose and the passion in my pace. Be my fight and my fervor and the calm in my haste. Be my breath when I'm breathless. Be the wind at my back. Be the strength in my knees and the courage I lack. Be my guide at each corner and my bridge over the stream. Be my stamina in weakness and my boldness to dream. Be the towel which soothes and mops the sweat from my face. Be my stimulant and tonic <clears throat> when I could give up the race. Be my victory, my joy, my objective, my prize. Let me share in the podium with you by my side. Amen. So let's sing. I need thee every hour, O gracious Lord. like thine can peace afford I need thee oh I need thee every hour I need thee oh bless me now my Savior I come to thee I need thee every hour say Temptations lose their power. 
motivational words from Paul related to sporting, this time from Philippians. This reading is taken from Philippians 3, verse 12, verse 16. Not that I've already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Following Paul's example, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's live up to what we've already attained, says Paul. Christ has already won us the prize. But let's not be complacent. Let's keep striving to be the best we can be for God. And let's leave off anything which is holding us back as individuals, as a team, as a church. Not dwelling on the past. Not letting the failures get the better of us, but looking forward, like Paul. Don't forget, Paul persecuted Christians before he came one. So if he'd spent the rest of his life dwelling on his previous errors, he wouldn't have had the same impact. He had much to regret, but it didn't stop him lifting the rest of his life for Jesus. It motivated him to make the best of the rest of the life that he had left. He says, athletes don't look back to the starting blocks because that will slow them down. They keep their eyes on the finishing line. And let's remember it's not a competition. Unlike the Olympics, it's a cooperation with each other. We might have differences on certain things, but we need to cooperate together, teamwork. If we have a competition, it's not with one another or other churches in the community or other denominations. Our competition is against the enemy of evil, the evil within us and the evil with the world at large. And again, unlike competition, we help one another get over the hurdles and the obstacles. We don't leave people behind flat on their face on the running track if they've tripped. The strong help the weak, the fast help the slow. There's the differences. So let's bear that in mind as we bring our prayer concerns to God. I'd like to begin our prayers with a prayer on screen from Ephesians this time. And it is a prayer to pray over one another. So we can pray this over one another, whether we're um, on Zoom or physically present or listening to the recording later. Pray it over the people that you might live with. Pray it over your church family too. Let's pray this prayer together. I pray that out of his glorious riches, God may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and I and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen. 
And so, Lord, as we continue in prayer, we pray for all those involved in the Olympics in any way. We pray for their health and safety, protection and peace. We pray for the countries represented, especially those going through really difficult times. We pray for those whose hopes will be crushed by exclusion or defeat. We pray particularly for the country of Japan and the city of Tokyo, that good will come out of this occasion. And we pray that the world and its leaders would take heed of the values embraced in the Olympic ideal. Jesus, save you to all, hear our prayer. We pray for the continued global rollout of the vaccination. We pray for wisdom and balance in the decision-making of the world's leaders and our own governments as we emerge from the pandemic. We pray for those seeking employment and those impacted by loss of livelihoods. We pray for hospitals, emergency and social care services who are currently understaffed to meet demands. And we pray for those who are overworked at this time and facing burnout. Jesus, save you to all, hear our prayer. We pray for countries suffering from extremes of the weather, particularly the floods experienced in Germany and Belgium and China and India. And we pray for the recovery and rescue teams. And for people who've lost everything, loved ones, homes and treasured possessions. Jesus, saviour to all, hear our prayer. We pray for children and families and teachers as they take their summer break. And for young people leaving school, anxious about exam results and future prospects. We pray that this summer will be a good time of rest and relaxation. Jesus, saviour to all. Hear our prayer. And as we lift the concerns closer to home, let's take a few moments of silence as we pray for those near to us and dear to us. We are particularly asked to remember in our prayers Daniel Cox, who is in Radcliffe Neurological Unit, Oxford, with serious head injuries, having apparently been beaten up. So we remember Daniel in our prayers, pray for his healing of physical and emotional scars after this traumatic event. Lord be with him, give him your comfort and your peace and your healing. Jesus, saviour to all, hear our prayer. 
Lord, help us to pass on the baton of love and faith to all those we meet in everyday life. May we run the race with eyes fixed on you, trusting that when the marathon of our life is over, our prize will be to be wrapped in your eternal love and crowned with your blessing. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now our final hymn, I've never really liked, to be honest, I never liked the, um, the words, especially when we had to sing it in school assembly, because I always imagined it being about a physical battle. But I realise I've matured that the words are about quite something different, our fight with the enemy. And the second verse is particularly relevant this morning. So let's sing, fight the good fight. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and forever. Amen. Let's bless one another as we share the grace together. The grace of our Lord, Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.